Hello and greetings to everyone in Northeast India at Gauhati University. Um, I'm Stephen Mori, as many of you know, and I'm speaking to you from my living room, the room where we entertain guests here in Melbourne, Australia, on a very cold morning, the 1st of May 2020. What we're going to do is I'm going to give you a short lecture about a particular aspect of linguistics, and then at 11.30 a.m. Indian time, we are going to all get onto Facebook and discuss the issues that we talked about. Okay, and the matter that we're talking about today is the alignment, the relationship between a verb and its arguments. So first of all, we want to, and these all are formed together as a clause. So what is a clause? A group of words which form a grammatical unit and which contain a subject and a finite verb, such as the children are sleeping. A clause can also have objects, such as the tiger chased the deer. In these examples, the children, the tiger and the deer are called arguments. The verb sleep requires only one argument, the one doing the sleeping. You can say the children are sleeping on the bed, the children are sleeping at night, but on the bed and at night, these are not arguments, they are not required by the verb. The verb chase, on the other hand, requires two arguments, the one chasing and the one being chased. When you have only one required argument, it's called intransitive. When you have two, it's called transitive. Okay, so to talk about these arguments, many linguists use the notations, the notions, sorry, A, P and S. You'll need to remember these. S is the single argument of an intransitive verb. The A is the more agent-like or subject-like argument in the transitive clause. And the P is the more patient-like or object-like argument. Some people use O for P instead of P, but we're going to use P in this discussion. So let's go back to the sentences we had before and work out which one of those three each of the arguments is. So the children are sleeping, the tiger chased the deer. So which of these, S, A and P, are the children, the tiger, and the deer. Think about that for a moment. The answers are on the next slide. So the children is the S, the single argument of an intransitive clause. The tiger is the A, the agent or subject-like argument of a transitive clause, because there is an object there. And the deer is the P, which is the patient or object-like argument of that same transitive clause. Okay, so this is an important concept to get because everything we're going to talk about in the next few minutes requires this. So let's look at some languages around the world. Some languages have a pattern which is usually called nominative accusative. And while I'm talking about this, you can think about languages that you know. Assamese, obviously, English, obviously, but possibly other languages too. So in Wanuko Quechua, Quechua is spoken in uh, South America, in Peru and um, Bolivia, but I think this is in Peru. Um, if you say, if you say John goes, you say Juan, Juan, I think they pronounce it as Juan, Juan, Juan. I don't know how to say this language properly. But John is an S argument, the single argument of an intransitive clause. If you say John hits Peter, Juan, Pedro ta, ma'an. Juan is the A, which is the, which is the more agent-like or subject-like argument of the transitive clause. And Pedro, Peter, is the P, the um, object or patient-like argument. And here we can see that A and S are marked in exactly the same way, but P is marked differently. That's called a nominative accusative pattern. 
It's also found in Latin. It's also found in Sanskrit. And it's found in English. But in English, we only see it with pronouns. So they went, they is an S argument, single argument of an intransitive clause. The girl saw them, them. The girl saw them, them is a um, patient argument, patient or object argument in a transitive clause, and they saw the girl, they is an agent argument, hence an A, this, the, the agent-like argument in a transitive clause. And here we can see that in English, S is the same as A. And that would be the case if we put I. I went, the girl saw me, I saw the girl. Or she, she went, the girl saw her, she saw the girl. The S equals the A, but not all languages do that. So in Arunta, this is a language spoken um, near and around a place called Alice Springs in Central Australia. Um, it has a, um, a lot of consonants and not so many vowels. The E symbol is used for a schwa, so uh. So um, the child was sitting, umpa anaka. The child chased the dog, ampala akmwelye alhuernaka, that's example three. And the dog bit the child, akmwelyela ampa uthnaka. Here we see a different pattern, but how are the A, S and P marked here? So I'm going to move to the next slide where I'll explain this. So in example one, umpa anaka, the child is an S, the single argument of an intransitive clause. In example two, akmwelya anaka, the child is, the dog is an S, the single argument of an intransitive clause. In three, the child is the A argument, the more agent or subject like, and the dog is the P argument, the object or patient. And in four, the dog is the agent and the child is the patient. So how are the A, S and P marked here? In sentence one, the child, umpa, is the S, and in sentence four, it is the P, and they're both the same. The child is in the form umpa when it's the subject of an intransitive clause, and it's in the form umpa when it's the object of a transitive clause. But when it's the subject of a transitive clause in sentence three, it becomes umpala with the additional l. And exactly the same thing happens with the dog, akmwelya, which is the s in sentence two and the p in sentence three, and the form is exactly the same. But in sentence four, where it's the a, a l is added. So l, we can say, marks the a. And this marking is called ergative. Where S equals P, that combination of those two is called the absolutive. And we can create the diagrams we see here on slide 10 to indicate this. So when a language has an ergative pattern, the S and the P are marked the same, but the A is different. When the language has an accusative pattern, the A and the S are the same, but the P is different. And these patterns are both named after the one that is different from the other two. So the first one is named after the A, the ergative. Second one is named after the P, the accusative. The S, the subject of the intransitive verb, aligns with one or the other, at least in the languages we just looked at. But it's not the same in every language. And you might start thinking about Assamese. You might start thinking about the kinds of sentences we've talked about and see what happens in Assamese. There are languages which do something else, and that is to say, mark the S, the A and the P differently. So in Wangamala, which is also spoken in the Northern Territory of Australia, slightly further north of Arunta, you have a different marker for the S, the A and the P. So the man died, kanaiya, ia marks the fact that the man is an S argument. The man hit the dog, 
kana ulu here because the man is the a argument he is marked differently but the dog too has a different marker titinana i presume that if one man hit the other or if the dog hit the man the dog would become something like titi ulu and the man would become something like kananana so there are three different markers in this language very complicated to learn and we can express that as we have here on slide 12 the s the a and the p are all different now my final example for you today is a language much closer to where you all are now and much closer to where you are than where i am and this is dai tin which is spoken in chin state in myanmar which is sort of next to Mizoram, across the other side of the border. And here, what do we see? So we see two sentences, I ran and I weeded the field. Now, in the first case, the I, which is a word, gay, one singular, is an S argument and it is unmarked. In, this, in sentence B, gay is followed by no. No is the ergative marker. So the A argument, I is the A argument in sentence B, and here it is marked differently. The P is low, which is the field, and it is, mar it is also unmarked, the same as the pronoun in sentence A. So here, the nouns are marked in exactly the same way as they would be in the Arunta language that we saw before, namely that the S in sentence A is marked in the same way as the P in sentence B, which is the field, and they are unmarked, and the A in sentence B, gay, I, is marked by the ergative. However, there's an interesting complication here. On the verb, there is a prefix, kah, K-A-H which refers to the subject. I should, instead of writing 1s colon a, which is what the linguist who analysed this, we should really write one, well, it's 1s and 1s means one singular, but it's a and s together because it refers back to the first singular regardless, in the same form, regardless of whether that first singular is an a or an s. So this language has a split system. We have to here examine how the nouns are marked and how the verbs are marked. And you might want to think about this in connection with Assamese also. So in Daichin, the nouns have an ergative absolutive system and the verbs have a nominative accusative system. Or to use the terminology we used earlier, the nouns follow the ergative system, but the verb marking follows the accusative system and only marks the A equals S argument on the verb. If we go back to slide, uh, slide 13, if I can work out how to do that. No, I can't. If you go back to slide 13, you will see that on the verb, the marking is the same for I, the word gay, and the form is ga, K-A-H, regardless of whether it's an S or an A. But the marking of the noun phrase that contains the pronoun is different. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. What I'm now going to do is to um, upload this and inform you all on the Facebook page, and hopefully I'll see you all at 11.30.